Our chair tonight is my neighbor and friend, the campus star, Professor Martin Chalfie of the chemistry department. Professor Chalfie was a co-recipient of the 2008 Nobel Prize. He's a Harvard PhD in neurobiology, uh, uh, 1977. Uh, 1982, he joined Columbia's faculty in the biological sciences, where he did research that led to the Nobel honor. He became a member of the National Academy of Sciences 2004. And he, uh, uh, he and his co-recipients were awarded the Nobel Prize in 2008 for their work in the discovery and development in the genre fluorescent protein, GFP, a naturally occurring substance in the jellyfish Aquaria Victoria that is used as a tool to make visible. I can't help laughing as I say that, right? The Aquaria Victoria. Anyway, uh, he discovered this, this substance which makes visible the actions of certain cells. Uh, their work opened with GFP opened a vast set of opportunities for studying biological processes at the molecular level. GFP provides a visual signal that scientists use to pro probe protein activity, such as when and where proteins are produced, and how different proteins or parts of proteins move and approach each other within a cell. I'm very grateful to him for thinking through the months with me about improvisation in the sciences and for putting together uh, today's uh, panel, whose members he'll introduce, Professor Martin Chalfie. It's going to take me a little while to set up. And then there will be a very boring blank slide to begin everything off with. And this is hooked up. I hope, anyway. Yes, nothing there. So I uh, want to give some brief remarks at the beginning and really set up the evening so that uh, I can let the other members of the panel uh, talk a little bit. And then we really want to open this up for questions. And we debated a little bit about what we should do since it was going to be a a talk about improvisation in science that maybe we should just not have any notes at all and just improvise the entire uh, set of talks. Uh, it's been a little bit like that, but, but not much. But before I actually start, I, I want to thank some people. First, I want to thank Bob O'Mealy, my neighbor, who uh, roped me into this. Uh, and, and got me started, but also introduced me to Romare Bearden and his work, which is really quite spectacular. So I want to repeat what he said. The last day of the exhibit is March 14th, and if you haven't seen it, it's over at the Wallach Gallery in Skirmahorn on the eighth floor, and it's really a spectacular exhibit. Uh, went over there this afternoon uh, with one of the speakers, uh, Nolan Motley. Uh, it's, it's really quite wonderful. I also want to thank uh, Yolanda Grant and, and Devlin Tyler, who have helped me throughout this entire process and kept me honest and, and everything, and it's quite wonderful. So when Bob first talked to me, he, he said, as I remember it, he said, do scientists improvise? And he explained the exhibit, and he explained that the two themes of the exhibit were that Bearden considered himself a jazz painter, an improvisational painter, and also that there was the theme in the Odyssey of returning home. And he said, is there anything in science that relates to this? And after my initial no, it was, oh, wait a minute. Yes, there is. So there are a number of things. So I want to give you sort of my personal take on this. Um, because I, th I, and I first want to take on the idea of returning home. Because I think, in, in fact, in science, we return home all the time uh, in, in what we do. There's a problem that has annoyed, on, uh, annoyed us, uh, it, it gotten on our nerves, and uh, aggravated us, and we keep going back to it because we never solve it. And so I, I want to illustrate that. I, uh, I, I do very important work. I, I, I say the sense of touch in a one millimeter long worm. Uh, I'm not going to go through a whole science lecture here, but just to say that this all started with uh, when I was a postdoc and working with this gentleman, John Sulston, 
And uh, this is an animal we know a lot about, and we can study the sense of touch, which for the most part, no one understands at all. We don't know the molecules. And so this was why I got interested, but it led to a whole series of problems. I want to say something while I have John's picture. John won the Nobel Prize in 2002 for his work, but I, he is an incredible experimentalist. He is one of the main people that gave us the human genome, the sequence of the human genome. started doing the work of all the DNA sequencing and all the arrangements, uh, all the things that needed to be done. He found that in his experiments, he needed somebody that could record very particular positions of bands on a gel, just positions of, of molecules. And he needed to have this done. And John is an incredibly original thinker. So this is going to be my first idea about improvisation in science. He was in Cambridge, England. He needed somebody that could easily look at the uh, results, measure the information, but most importantly, enter it into the computer accurately. So he thought about this for a while, and he went off to the local Sainsbury's uh, grocery store. And he looked down the line of the cashiers, and he looked at the cashier that seemed to be the most accurate in how she was doing the work, and he went up to her and he, she, he said, would you like to use all the skills you currently have entering data, just like entering the price of the groceries, but we'll pay you more and you'll be part of a scientific enterprise. And he hired her and several other of the cashiers at the grocery store, and they became part of his research uh, project. So John's a very original thinker and very you know, uh, different in terms of this, and is not afraid to go off in different directions. But I was talking about the idea of going home. And uh, I've been interested in these cells. I get mutants that are insensitive to the touch, and they lead me into two general areas. How do you make a particular type of cell, and how does it sense touch? And these problems have been grating on my nerves since I started this in 1977. And so recently I made a, a graph, and it really isn't important what the various categories are, except to say that they're different lines of research. And each one of the black bars represents a publication. And as you look at this graph, you'll see that there are nice, large, blank spaces where we didn't have a clue. And then suddenly an idea came up, and then it, there was a flurry. Or more likely, somebody came to the lab with some really good ideas, and we started working in a different way. So we always keep going home to these same problems over and over and over again, but we never quite finish it, we let it go for a while, and then return back because the problem is always there. We always want to get back to it. So I think in, in, in that sense, I think we do like to go back home uh, in terms of science. The second thing was, what about improvisation in science? Now, the great physicist Enrico Fermi has a wonderful line in which he says something to the order of, if you do an experiment, and it confirms your hypothesis, you've made a measurement. But if you do an experiment and it doesn't confirm your hypothesis, then you've made a discovery. And so all the discoveries are, most of the discoveries at least, are accidents. And it's what you do with the accidents and the change. And that's the part where I think improvisation really comes in in science, to be able to, just completely change your area of research and go in a completely new direction simply because you've made an observation or realized something that you hadn't done before. And one of the joys of doing science is, in fact, to make those sudden real, have those sudden realizations and change the way we're doing things. And part of this also, the improvisational part of science, is something that we actually saw today when we heard the music. Uh, it was really great to watch Kojo's face when he was playing, because it was clear he was smiling and really enjoying it. And Antoine, when he stopped playing, and so he could 
listen, he was also smiling. There's an element, we talk about playing music, but there's an element of play, of enjoyment of the new and the unusual and the things that come out. And this comes out in science. And I, there's a whole series of papers that came out in the January issue of the journal Current Biology, something I'm sure all of you read uh, every day. But it was their 20th anniversary, and they have a whole series of articles on play and science, which I'm fortunate to look at. And you gave me some ideas of this. But they talk about play in dogs, play in insects, or in, 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 in invertebrates, in other animals, and play in humans. And one of the essays is by uh, Patrick Bateson. And I would just want to, and he talks about some rather famous scientists from the past. So he says here, the discoverer of penicillin, Alexander Fleming, was famous for his playfulness. He was accused disapprovingly by his boss of treating research like a game, finding it all great fun. When asked what he did, he said, I play with microbes and went on, it is very pleasant to break the rules and to be able to find something that nobody had thought of. And then he goes on to describe uh, one of the more famous uh, physicists of the, the last century, uh, Richard Feynman, who also, while he at an early stage in his career, basically said, I'm sort of tired of physics. It's no fun anymore. And so he decides, I'm just going to do what's fun. And that's when he started doing his groundbreaking work that led to his Nobel Prize. So there's an element of playfulness in all the things that we do. And I think this is part of the intersection between science and improvisation. And I'm, that's the end of my little presentation. I'm going to call on various members of the panel, and we're going to hear people that are musicians. In fact, everyone in the group is a musician to some degree or another. Uh, we are, there are people that look at the neurobiology of, of uh, improvisation. There are people that are involved in using improvisation in teaching science and to direct their research. And we're going to hear many other examples. So I want to first start with George Lewis. George is the, uh, let's get the right name here, the Edwin H. Case Professor of American Music here in the Music School. Uh, jazz performer himself uh, on the trombone. Uh, absolutely outstanding. The first time I heard George, he was giving the university lecture here at Columbia. And his topic, which I think is more or less what his topic is going to be here, was improvisation as a way of life. It was very, very nice. So George, it's now up to you. <laughs> 